This is Jack Sheffield with PassContractorExam.com. If you're taking the roof and exam, you're going to want to get familiar with this manual right here. It's called the Architectural Sheet Metal Manual. It's uh, put out by the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association, also known as SMACNA. You're going to know that the question comes out of this book more than likely because they're going to tell you according to the Sheet Metal Associations and Air Conditioning Contractors Manual. All right, that's a good thing. If they don't tell you that, and they don't tell you what it's another manual, then, well, you just got to pretty much understand that it's sheet metal and it could come out of this book, it could come out of NARCA, it could come out of the Roofing Construction Estimating. This book, you are going to see stuff at if you've even been in the business that you'll, you've never seen and you probably never will see. There's a lot of highly, highly technical information about gutters and flashing and downspouts and just a wide variety of, of things, copings and stuff, things that you just don't run across in the field on a, on a daily basis. Maybe if you were doing a major major roofing job where you it was multi-story commercial you know skyscraper type stuff you might run into this but otherwise this I would say for 99% of you you're gonna see this and use this now and then once this test is over you'll probably won't open this book again let's go through it and see what we got here um, this book has got some crazy crazy tables and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. Um, first of all, let's look at the table of contents. These SMACNA books tend not to have good tables of contents, so um, hopefully you won't have to depend on it too much. It does have a table of contents. Um, but since it's not a real good one, you may need to use the table of contents. So you gotta, you can take a look at, the, at what it talks about here. Just kind of give you an overall, overall view. It does talk a lot about roof drainage systems, so we'll talk a lot about gutters. There's a chapter on gravel stop and fascia. There's a uh, chapter on copings. There's a chapter on flashing. Building expansion, middle and wall roof systems, middle roof and wall systems, louvers and screens, other metal structures, historical restoration, and then you have some appendices that talk about different types of metal. says here you do have an index but once again I'm not real crazy about the index in this book all right chapter one roof drainage systems let's take a look and see what we have we have a table on the left hand column and you kind of got to read this whole section to get an idea what what they're what they're talking about so let's read this whole section roof area to be considered the design capacity for a roof drainage system Depends on the quantity of water to be handled. That makes sense, right? Okay, the quantity of water in turn depends on the roof area, slope, and rainfall intensity. Got three things there. Whenever you have three things, guess what? You might get a negative question. Which of the following is not a consideration? Okay, in considering the roof area, remember that rain does not necessarily fall vertically. And that maximum conditions exist when rain falls perpendicular to a surface. Since the roof area increases as pitch increases, it is not advisable to use plan area of a pitched roof in the calculation of, an, of a drainage system. So we're not going to use plan area. We have to make an adjustment to plan area. All right. We're told the true area of a pitched roof often leads to oversizing of gutters, downspouts, and drains. To determine the design area for a pitched roof, use table 1-1. All right, so let's just say we had a 7-12 to roof and it was 2,000 square feet. Well, you would actually use, take that 2,000 and multiply times 1.1, so you'd have a 2,200 square foot roof that you are actually designing your gutter system for. If the plan area was 2000 and it was a 712, you would multiply that plan area by 1.1. That's pretty simple. 
To determine the design area, we're told underneath, multiply the plan area by the factor in column B. That's just what we did. 2,000 becomes 2,200. These areas are then divided by the proper factor given in table 1.2, 1-2, thus obtaining the required area in square inches for each downspout. All right, so let's take a look then. Table 1.2 in Jacksonville, Florida, we could uh, we could expect in a 10-year storm. Let's use column A in a storm that should only be exceeded once in 10 years. So this is basically a 10-year rain. Okay, a downspout is going to serve 150 square feet per square inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our calculator on that roof and we're going to say, let's go ahead and do that. Let's unlock this thing and let's take our calculator and we have 2,200 square feet, we, were, we said, and each square inch of downspout is going to drain 160 square feet. So divide by 160, and you will need 13.75 square inches of downspout to service this roof. So, what you do then is you go to the next table, table 1.3, and we see, let's say we, we were told that we were going to use plain rectangular gutters, or downspouts, we're really talking about downspouts here, not gutters. We're going to use plain rectangular downspouts, and they were going to be four inch downspouts, which are actually three by four. How many would we need? Well, a three by four downspout is 12 square inches. Well, one downspout wouldn't drain that roof. We would need two downspouts to drain, two of these downspouts to drain 13.75, uh, to, to attain 13.75 square inches. Wow. Right? Okay, so let's take a look again what we did. We find the design area. We find, first of all, we get the plan area. We multiply times this number to get the design area. All right. Then we take, then we look and see where they're telling us how many, uh, you know, like for in this case, it was Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, did I get it wrong? It was 150. I was doing Miami. Miami was 160. Either way, we divide it by our roof area, okay, uh, uh, and this is this is roof area drained per downspout area. So this was actually 150 or Miami 160. 160 square feet per square inch of downspout. So we divide our square footage by the number in this column. That tells us how many square inches of downspout we need. Then we go over to this table and based on the type of downspout we have and what this what the uh, area is we know how many downspouts we need lots of stuff there about downspouts okay let's back up just a moment there's a couple things that i want you to highlight that we that we uh, that we bypass downspout considerations i want you to highlight letter c on page 1.1 downspouts should be constructed with conductor heads every 40 feet to admit air and to prevent a vacuum. All right, so if you're dropping that downspout more than 40 feet, well, um, you've got to have a, a, a conductor head so there, so uh, vacuum on occurs. Okay, there we go. Let's go to page 1.4. I want you to highlight paragraph number one. The gutter capacity and length. To limit the effects of thermal expansion in gutters, 50 feet is the practical maximum gutter length to be served by a downspout.
Now here's an interesting table on table 1-4, sloped roof gutters, maximum roof area for gutters. The best way to take a look at this table is to look at the sample problem that they have here. And this will help us walk, walk through another exercise. And what they'll do on the test is a lot of times they'll, they'll give you the exact same sample problem that's in the book, which really helps out a lot. If you can find the sample problem, you can get the answer. What we're going to do is we're going to size a half round gutter for a building with a flat roof that's 80 by 40 feet. It's located in Kansas City, Missouri. This building has a parapet wall on three sides and a gutter to be located on an 80-foot side. Because the gutter will exceed 50 feet, we're going to use two downspouts with an expansion joint between them. So let's look at let's look at the solution. We got two downspouts. So the area of the building is 3,200 square feet. So each downspout is going to serve 1,600 square feet. From table one two, next to Kansas City, note that one square inch of downspout will drain 160 square feet of roof area. It's the exact same thing as Miami. So we can go back and look if you want. Kansas City, Missouri, one square inch of downspout, that's this column right here, will drain 160 square feet of roof. Since each downspout is serving 1,600 square feet, we divide the 1,600 by 160 to determine that each downspout should have a minimum area of 10 square inches. Ah, okay. 10 square inches. We're doing table 1-3 shows us that a 4 inch downspout is required. So we look over to um, table 1-3. Table 1-3 once again shows us that a 4 inch downspout is required. How do we know that? Because this is our nominal size. This is a four inch. We needed 10 square inches, right? Well, you can't go less. You got to go to the next highest one. So in a plain round, it, it's 12.57. That would be more than 10 inches. That's a four inch. Same thing with corrugated round. If we use a four inch, we'd get 11.4. In a plain rectangular, a four inch would give us 12. And in a rectangular corrugated, a 4-inch would get us 11.7. So we need a 4-inch downspout to serve this roof. That's the first thing we need. Now the next thing we're told we're going to do is from chart 1.2, determine that a 9.5-inch round gutter should be used. Now you got to distinguish. It's real easy to get confused between downspouts and gutters. We, we figured out what downspout we needed. Now they're telling us we want to go find a half round gutter. So let's go to chart 1.2. We have 15, uh, 1,600 square feet. And how much rainfall are we going to need? Are we, how, much, how much rainfall in inches per hour? Well, hold on a second. Let's go back to Kansas City. Kansas City said 7.4 inches in an hour, right? 7.4 inches in an hour. So, when we take 1,600 square feet and we match it up with 7.4 inches an hour, we're going to get somewhere right in that area right here. We match those up, and if you read this line, this is a 9 inch, that's a 10 inch. So you need about a 9 and a half inch half round gutter. A 9 and a half inch half round gutter. Wow. Okay. The area and flow table in table 1 4 are based on one inch of rainfall per hour. Divide these areas by the local rainfall in inches to determine the actual roof area to be served by the gutter diameter. 
So that takes you through um, that particular sample problem. That last thing I said was a little confusing if you haven't done this before, so let's, let's look at that last thing again. Table 1.4 based on one inch of rainfall per hour. All right. Divide these areas by the local minimum rainfall in inches per hour to determine the actual roof area to be served by the gutter diameter. All right, so we said we were going to use a 9.5 inch gutter on that particular problem. The area of that particular gutter is 39.1 square inches. Let's see how they got that first. If you know pi r squared, now this is a half round gutter, so the radius is 5. So pi is 3.14 times 5 times 5 equals 78.5. Well, we have to divide that by 2 because that's the area of the circle, and this is a half round gutter, divided by 2 equals 39.25. That's, that's basically this number right here. It's your half round, 10 inch diameter gutter. This is the area of the gutter itself. Now, if the gutter was level, it would serve, it says 14,400. If, if we put in a slope of an eighth of an inch per foot, it would hold, it would, it would handle 20,400 square feet. But remember, what did this say? This said that this table was based on one inch of rainfall per hour. All right, and you had to divide whatever that number was by how many inches of rainfall per hour there was in that city. So we go over to, we go back, remember Kansas City, Missouri was 7.4. So we take our 14,400, 14,400, and we divide it by 7.4, and we get what? 1945. Guess what? What was the area of the roof to be drained? 1,600 square feet, right? Because we had two gutters. 1945. That's how much it would drain in Kansas City, Missouri. That's how many square feet it would handle. And we're only asking it to handle 1,600. So we have sized that 10 inch or 9.5 inch, but we had to go up to a 10. We sized that 10 inch half round gutter correctly to put that gutter in level. Now we can get more out of it if we put an eighth of an inch per slope and even more if we put in a quarter inch per slope. You think anybody actually calculates this stuff on gutters? You know not for residential, for sure. But you never know. On huge uh, uh, um, projects, you know, like I said, you know, skyscraper type, you know, 7, 8, 10, 20, 30 story projects, you might actually have to do this. All right. Here we go. That... I told you that this 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 uh, book would rock your world. It will rock your world. Okay, I'll give you a few uh, sample problems later. See if we can uh, give you uh, some practice with this. Let's go to uh, uh, page one point ten. We're talking about rectangular gutter design here. I want you to highlight paragraph A. The front edge of the gutter should be lower than the back edge, so any overflow will spill over the front of the gutter. That's always good. The elevation difference should be one twelfth of the gutter width with a one inch minimum. Some machine manufactured gutter profiles do not have that one inch differential. Hanging gutters at slope roofs should have the front edge in line with the roof slope line. Hmm. Okay. Now, let's look about the sizes of the metal that we're going to use for a gutter. Now you have to know the gutter width. How do we figure that out? Well, you measure along the back, along the bottom, and then up the front, and that'll give you the gutter width. And let's say we had a two foot gutter width, and we're gonna use galvanized steel, and we wanna know what gauge of steel has to be. Well, it's 22. Same situation, if we're using aluminum, it should be 51 thousandths of an inch thick. There you go. There's a table 
girth with regard to what thickness of the metal we need. Look at all the different styles there. You could be shown a particular a diagram and they'll want to know what style is it. Well, there you go. This is the um, this is a half round and this is a um, an OG gutter. They call this an OG gutter and you can see why. All right, and you've got in like let's look at this eight inch gutter. It's eight inches across, but we know that's the full diameter. The actual radius is four inches. There you go. That's why on that 10 inch gutter we used a five inch radius when we did the area calculation. And then we divided by two. Okay, here's another one that'll that'll uh, get your attention. This uh, this 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 uh, diagram on page 1.17. Let's take a look and see what they're talking about here. First of all, it's a built-in gutter. And I want you to highlight that we always have a four inch minimum across the bottom. And then I want you to see this angle A. So this is that back angle of the gutter. And angle B, that's the front angle of the gutter. Okay, base is always four inches. Hopefully you'll get the base question, that's easy. But if you get the question about A and B, here's what you gotta do. Though that A and B relates to the table on the next page, table 1.6 on page 1.18. Now, first of all, and you see this a couple times in this book, there's the, the book itself has errors in it. If your book says A90 here and B and A135, you have to change the, the, that second A to a B. It should say A90 B135, A90 B120, A90 B90. Now what does that mean? Well, remember those angles on the previous diagram? Angle A and angle B, those are the degrees of that angle. All right. Remember we said the, there was also, uh, you had to factor in the width of the gutter bottom, so four, six, eight inches. All of these are the gutter bottom. All right. So, let's say we were told that dimension of the degree A was 90 and B was 135 and the bottom was 4, just like you see in the picture. A is 90, B is 135, the width of the gutter bottom is 4 inches. All right. Well, first of all, we have to know what we're using. Okay. Let's say they told us that we were using 16 ounce copper for, let's see, 16 ounce copper for our material. All right, so A90, that means we have to use column A. If A told us 24 ounce copper, we would have to use column C, but we'll go ahead and use column A because they told us 16 ounce copper. So A is 90, B is 135, the bottom of the gutter is 4, we're using column A because it's 16 ounce copper, and the answer that we get off the table is 22. Well, what does 22 mean? Well, what is the table about? This is the maximum distance between an expansion joint and a downspout in a built-in gutter. So if you're building a built-in gutter and you have these conditions that we just talked about, the maximum distance you would want to put between an downspout and expansion joint is 22 feet. That's some pretty crazy stuff if you ask me. But you might just get that question on the test. That's the one day in your life that you need to know that. All right, let's go on. Uh, 1.20. Um, figure 15C, and that's over here. Let's read this whole thing. We really need to look at all of these. If the downspout, so I'm reading here and we're looking at this at these these figures over here. 
If the downspout and gutter outlet are designed for flexibility, such as with a flexible section of downspout or with an open vented connection, plan for relative movement of the components. See figure 15G and 15H. Figure 15G shows the downspout over vent, overflow vent with some provision for expansion movement between the gutter and the downspout. That's 15G. D E F G. Okay, that's what they're that's what they're pointing to right there. Figure 15C, this one, illustrates the rule of 50 feet. Okay, the maximum length of gutter of gutter per downspout is satisfied by locating two gutter outlets at the same anchor point. Now what they don't see, they don't show you, is there's two others that you can use as well. There's two, as long as you aren't serving more than 50 feet for a downspout, you could have them in the middle, you could have them in the ends, or you could have them like they have in figure 15C. So these, all three of these are okay. If we skip a paragraph, we're told that the E value, E usually means expansion in construction. You're going to use this table down here, table 1.7. So it gives an expansion joint dimension for sections AA of figures 151 and so forth. Okay. Expansion coefficients are commonly used for metals or given in Appendix A, and we'll see that when we get there. Now, what we're, uh, it gives us 50 foot and 10 foot uh, sections. So let's just take a look. Here, we, here on the left hand column, we have our temperature change. Let's say we have a 120 degree temperature change. If we're using copper or stainless steel and we have a 10 foot section, it's going to expand about an eighth of an inch. If we have a 50 foot section, it'll expand about a half of an inch. That's, that's copper or stainless at 120 degrees temperature difference. Let's keep going. Lots of stuff about gutters. This is a combination on page 1.32. This is a combination scupper and gutter. Figure 1-11 over here illustrates a roof edge with scuppers that empty into a gutter. The scuppers are soldered into a formed gravel stop fascia system. The suggested maximum scupper interval is 10 feet. The front rim of the gutter must be one inch below the back edge. We saw that already and it should be below the nailers used to elevate the roof edge. The drip edge on the fascia, right here, this drip edge, should overlap the back edge of the gutter a minimum of one inch. There you go, right there. The gutter must be free to move behind the fascia. Let's go to the next page. We're hanging these gutters. We're in this right-hand column just, just above the table where brackets, cradles, or straps are used to support a gutter. They are normally installed on 36-inch maximum centers. Recommended minimum sizes are shown in Table 1.8. Here it is. In no case should brackets thickness be less than twice that of the gutter. All right, so let's just say our girth, remember that 24-inch uh, uh, gutter girth? I know that's not the one highlighted, but let's just use that one instead. The 24 inch gutter girth, if we're using galvanized steel, should be a quarter by an inch and a half bracket or strap size. The stainless steel, here's your numbers over here. This is the strap size for a particular gutter. But make sure that you understand this too. In no case should bracket thickness be less than twice that of the gutter. You could need, you could need to override this information in that case. Still talking about installing brackets um, and it says the uh, right here on the right hand column the last couple of sentences in that first paragraph spacing of brackets 
should be on 36 inch centers. The first ply of roofing is extended into the gutter to divert away any, bit, any uh, bitumen drippage. There's another way on page 138 and 139 to hang a gutter. One of them is called the spike and ferrule. Right hand column, first full paragraph. The spike and ferrule method is typical of residential construction. It's not recommended for gutters having a girth of over 15 inches. Let's go to page 1.46. We're still hanging gutters and we're on a sloped roof. Right hand column, second paragraph. When the fascia board is less than two inches thick, the spikes must be driven into the rafter ends. There you go, it shows you right there, page 147. A lot of times you'll have a one by fascia that you'll have to, you'll have to go all the way through. Let's go to page 152. These are built-in gutters, built-in gutter installation. We're told here that the front edge of the gutter should be lower than the back edge by one inch per foot with a one inch minimum. That's the third time we've seen that. It also tells you some information. I'm always looking for additional information that will make good test questions. This building, it says the gutter, I'm in the left hand column, second paragraph, the gutter is installed on wood blocking covered with an underlayment of 30 pound felt with rosin paper over the felt. Continue, its cleat is loose locked to the back edge of the gutter. The cleat extends four inches onto the roof. So that's one way to do built in gutter installation. Page 154 and 155 discuss water diverter design. We're talking about dimension A in this third paragraph, okay? Um, let's look at this dimension A. It says dimension A, this is the height of that water diverter, will vary with the pitch and the area of the roof to be drained. A minimum height of four inches is recommended. It also says in the paragraph before that that the gutter should, the gutter should extend up the roof far enough that the back edge is three inches higher in elevation than the top of the beam. Let's keep going. Page 158, gutter accessories. Let's uh, talk about an outlet tube. Top right on page 158. Typical outlet tubes are shown in figure 124C. Here they are right here. These two left ones at the bottom. Outlet tubes may be of any shape necessary to fit the downspout. Outside dimensions of outlet tubes should be an eighth of an inch less than the inside of the downspout. The outlet tube should be a minimum length of four inches after a three-eighths of an inch flange has been turned at the top. That's what's key. Make sure you don't forget about that three-eighths of an inch flange. Before, uh, before the flange is turned, it's got to be four and three-eighths inches. And that's where they're going to try to get you. The roof and test is the trickiest of all. They're going to try to trick you with converting inches to feet and feet to inches without telling you. The book will give you the answer in feet. The test will be asking you in inches. And guess what? The feet answer will be a choice. you got to really watch for those types of things. For some reason, the roofing test is the trickiest of all. All right, let's look at the second paragraph on page 1-60, left-hand column. Figure 1-25 illustrates some of the many designs used for conductor heads. It is re recommended that the depth of its top opening equal two-thirds of its width. The depth of its top opening equal two-thirds of its width. And this is conductor heads. Now, if you don't know what those are, water's coming off a roof somehow, maybe possibly through a scupper, or through maybe there's just a downspout going into a conductor head and um, and uh, there they are. Conductor heads and downspouts should be fabri fabricated of the same material. Right hand column, second uh, first full paragraph. 
the recommended minimum for construction of conductor heads is 24 gauge galvanized, 32 thousandths aluminum, 16 ounce copper, or 26 gauge stainless steel. The face width of your conductor head should be three to four times the downspout width. The depth should be two times the downspout width and the height should be three to four times the downspout width. There you go. Scupper design and installation on page 1.62. First paragraph, last sentence. The conductor head should be a minimum of two inches overall wider than the scupper. See that right there. All right. Figure 126A shows a section through the parapet wall at the scupper. A conductor head is attached to the wall with masonry fasteners. All right. Go to the next paragraph. A closure flange is locked to the scupper and soldered or sealed at the top as shown in detail one. Right here. There you go. There's detail one. That's a closure flange. All right. It should be a minimum of a half inch wider than the conductor head on each side. All right. Let's keep rolling. Let's go to page 1-1.66, left-hand column. We're talking about scuppers going through fascia with a conductor head like you see here in this diagram. Second paragraph. The conductor head, once again, should be a minimum of two inches wider than the scupper. Scupper is fabricated with a flange which extends onto the tapered edge strip and back four inches onto the roof. There you go, right there. Because the scupper goes four inches back onto the roof. Recommended, bought last thing on the page, recommended minimum for construction of scuppers is 24 gauge galvanized steel, 40 thousandths aluminum, 16 ounce copper, or 26 gauge stainless steel. Another way to do scuppers, okay, this is, um, it says the scupper is fabricated with a flange which extends on the roof, on a tapered edge strip, back four inches onto the roof, okay. All joints are soldered except in aluminum construction. In aluminum construction, welded joints are used. Let's go to page 1.70. This is an overflow scupper. Figure, I'm in the right hand column, first full paragraph. Figure 130B pictures the scupper and shows a counter flashing over the roof side flange. This flange extends four inches onto the roof cant. You need to stop and take a look and you know before we go on so you get a good idea of what you're looking at, do that. Okay, let's go to page 1.72. We're back to downspouts. Alright, we're back to downspouts. This table should look familiar. You've already seen a table with these four left-hand columns. We have our plain round, our corrugated round, our plain rectangular, our rectangular corrugated, the area in square inches, the nominal size. Remember those four inch, uh, four inch, you know, uh, four inch corrugated round? They actually didn't even put them up here. They just missed it. There's a lot of mistakes on these tables. Um, they don't even have the actual size of a corrugated round. You know, there's just things that are missing, but that's okay. But remember, we talked about a plain rectangular 3x4, which was a 4-inch nominal. It was it measured 3x4. It had 12 square inches. Well, what if we were going to make it, and we decided we, we, we were going to use stainless steel? Well, how big were, should we have, should, how thick was, should our metal be? Well, there it tells us, 28-gauge stainless. We can go to 26-gauge galvanized or 25,000 aluminum or 16-ounce copper. This just tells us our downspout. It takes that one table we had and just adds metal thicknesses to it. Page 1.76. We are um, looking at these accessories here. The bottom left on that first column, the minimum flange width for outlets is 3 8 of an inch. The flange is riveted and soldered. A splash pan for a gutter. The back height should be four inches greater 
than the downspout. The back width should be four inches. That's what we're told. So we'll believe it and we'll answer it just like that on the test. Chapter two in the Smackna book is about gravel stop and fascia. Let's take a look and see what we got here. It talks about fastening on page 2.1. Annual. This is uh, paragraph number two. Annular ring or barbed shank, one inch long roofing nail, space them three inches on center in a staggered pattern. That's the way they want you to put the gravel stop and fascia on. Thickness. Use table 2.1 face limit dimensions to determine the thickness relative to style and types of joints. Four inches flat vertical height is the maximum for an uncleated, unlocked edge. Cleats. Horizontal cleats. This is paragraph 5 on page 2.2. .2. Should be continuous. Continuous meaning lengths not to exceed 12 feet with a quarter of an inch clearance between the ends. Corners. Fascia corners must provide the same degree of waterproofing as straight sections and joints. They may be formed, welded, seam locked, mitered, lap, riveted, one inch on center and solder, or you can lap them one inch minimum. Seal and rivet one inch on center. There you go. Now this is the table they were talking about. Take a look at this table. This table is crazy. What are all these squiggly lines down at the bottom? That's the first thing we need to look at. Let's look at all those squiggly lines. Okay, we're talking about fascia and gravel stop here, right? And design and how they're joint. These are the joinery methods. This first one is just a four inch lap. Okay. Then you've got all these others. This is a button backup plate. This is an offset. And all these have, they're all listed. J1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through 12. Got it? For instance, let's say we had copper. We were we had copper fascia. It was 16 ounce copper. Alright. And our face dimension on that fascia was nine inches or less. Let's say it was a six inch face. What joinery methods could we use? Well, there you go. We could use joints. We could lap it. We could just, we could do the button backup plate. We could do, it doesn't say three though, it says four. Can't do this, but we can do this. We can do four. Button cover plate. Butt it up and cover it. Okay, five, nine, 11 and so forth with 16 ounce copper. Now if it had a if it had a bigger face dimension oh from nine over nine to 12 had a 10 inch face dimension they want you to get fancy. They want you to do J8, 9, 10, 11 or 12 or 12. There you go. So you got to get a little more complicated because you got a really big piece of metal there and you got to make sure you can't just lap it it'll flap around. So that's how you read that table. You're going to see that table again when it comes to coping. All right. It says on page 2.8 that figure 2-5 illustrates three, three different joints for form gravel stop fascia systems. You can solder and weld the joints. It says that's not recommended, except at your corners because they offer no provision for expansion and contraction. Figure 25A, this one here, okay, it shows the gravel stop installed with a quarter inch opening between the pieces. You see that dot, the two dotted lines there. Then you cover it with a six inch cover plate. That's one way to do it. This figure 525 b shows it just, just, just uh, lapped four inches. And then this figure, 25C actually shows with the plate on the back of it. Okay. And it actually says it's a 12 inch backup plate if you look at the uh, 
if you look at the text. When you're putting on gravel stop, there's also fascia here on page 2.11, you're supposed to screw 24 inch maximum on center through watertight washers to install it. There you go. And that is on that particular, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going back to that, that is on that particular type of installation. That's a raised curb consisting of nailers. All right, that's a flat roof there. Okay, let's move forward. Copings, chapter three, copings. shows you a coping here, figure 3-1, and in that left-hand column, second paragraph, we're told that, it's actually third paragraph, all seams and joints should be sealed, corners on coping should be formed watertight, welded, or, mortar, or mitered, seamed, and sealed. Materials with a minimum thickness of 60 thousandths of an inch can be field welded. Last paragraph, all single lap joints should be 4 inches minimum width, all backup plates should be 12 inches, all cover plates should be 6 inches minimum. There you go. Once again, you have the same table. It's a little bit more dramatic. It's got these, the middle of it is actually filled in, and there's actually some missing. They didn't put the J's all in this middle section, okay? Because the J, remember, is referring to the type of joint here. But either way, it's got the same metal here. It's got your face dimension for your coping, but now it actually has a top dimension, so you have something else thrown in. So let's, let's go back to that 16-ounce copper coping. All right? And let's say that the top dimension was... 10 inches, okay? You can use any joints you want if the top dimension is 10 inches, but you also have to consider the face dimension. If you had a 10 inch face dimension as well, guess what? You could only use joints 8 through 12, and that would be these fancy joints here. So when you're, when you're looking at your coping, you have to consider your top dimension, and your face dimension and the size of the metal in order to determine the types of joints that you can use. Okay. Those are some crazy tables right there. Took me a while to figure out what the heck they were talking about. On page 4.1, it's actually chapter 4. We're talking about flashing in chapter 4. And on page 4.1, we're told that it is suggested that architects should specify through wall flashings. Okay, this is flashings that actually are built into the wall and then come out to form counter flashings and so forth. They have to be furnished and cut to size by sheet metal contractor. Joints and flashings should generally lap 4 inches and be soldered or sealed. Every third seam or 24 to 30 feet, a loose lock expansion joint is required. You've got a lot of different ways you can do that on page 4.3. You might want to take a minute and look at all those through wall flashing um, methods. Let's look on, um, like I said, uh, the through wall flashing a lot of times is used with counter flashing. Over the next several pages, there's lots of different ways to do counter flashing. Try not to get confused because it'll say counter flashing, you'll think you'll be done, then I'll talk about more about counter flashing. It's because there's a lot of different ways to do it. 
Um, general information about counter flashing, second paragraph, metal counter flashing should be used in conjunction with composition base flashings. Uh, next paragraph, metal counter flashing is installed so that a minimum of four inches of the base flashing is covered. Now I've seen a different number in that before. You want to make sure that this book says four inches. Metal base flashing is not recommended for use with membrane roofing systems. That's metal base flashing. Um, counter flashing installation, third, third paragraph down. After the counter flashing is installed, bend the receiver at a 40, 45 degree angle to provide an eave drift. That's kind of what you got right over here. Okay, you want that to kind of kick that water away. Let's go to the right hand column. Figure 4E, 44E, that's this one right here, shows a method of installing a counter flash in an existing masonry wall. What you do is you cut a reglet, you cut that reglet in the masonry joint to at least an inch and a half. You insert the counter flashing into the reglet, hold it in place by spring action. Okay, see detail one right there. Okay, so you cut it so there's a there's like a little flange on there and you stick it in there to hold it in place. Okay, then you fill the regular with a sealant. You notch and let the counter flashing at corners and joints. Okay, figure four or five A, all right, shows counter flashing installed using a metal regular which is furnished by the sheet metal contractor for installation by others. The regular is attached to the forms before the concrete is poured. All right, so in this situation, this reglet would be would, would be in here before the concrete is poured. Reglet corner should be more miter. The counter flashing is held in place by wedges. So you come in here with this, this metal counter flashing, you've got these wedges, all right, and the reglet is filled with sealant. The counter flashing is notched and lapped to the inside corners and joints. Outside corners are notched and seams. Reglets installed in concrete forms usually need to be fastened 12 inches on center to avoid being dislodged. Hmm. Okay. The recommended minimum gauge for counter flashing here is 16 ounce copper, 26 gauge stainless, 26 gauge galvanized steel. Here's another way to install it. Figure 4.6 illustrates the installation of counter flashing in concrete walls where reglets are not used. Figure 4.6 in this figure, counter flashing is held in place by use of masonry anchors. It says 18 inches on center. Does yours say 12 inches on center here in the diagram? Does that counter contradict each other? Hmm. Probably want to go with 12. Counter flashing should be lapped at joints and mitered and soldered or sealed at corners. The recommended minimum gauge is 16 ounce copper, 26 stainless, 24 galvanized steel, or 32 ounce aluminum. Flashing material should be at least 24 ounce copper, 24 gauge stainless, 22 gauge steel, or 50 thousandths aluminum. Let's take a look at the next page. We have another way to do counter flashing. Okay. This is like if you have some type of structural steel deck and you can hook you can hook around that uh, that flange there. The cleat is held in place by mechanical fastening to the steel at 24 inches on center. Okay, you with me there? Lap the flashings at the joints and miter and solder or seal them. So you have you've got a you got a cleat that comes around here and then you have your other flashing that comes up underneath it like that. There you go, the counter flashing. The recommended minimum gauge for counter flashing in this figure is 16 ounce copper, 26 stainless, 24 galvanized, or 32 thousandths aluminum. 
Valley flashing. Left hand uh, column, second paragraph. The open portion of the valley should be a minimum of five inches. The shingle should lap the flashing a minimum of five inches. The edges of the valley should be formed with a hook and edge and cleated on 24 inch centers. That's the way the Smagna book says do it. On roof pitches over 6 and 12 and on dissimilar pitches, increase the inverted V to 2 inches in height that you see there. Flashings are generally formed in 10 foot sections. They should be lapped 8 inches in the direction of flow. The top of each section should be fastened with nails material compatible with a flashing. The felt in the valley should lap six inches over the upper ends of the valley flashing pieces and the, uh, the roofing felt should lap over the cleated edge of the flashing. More valley flashing installation on page 4.22, right hand column at the top, flashing should be 18 inches wide for slope six inches or more to the foot. For a slope of less than six inches, you might want to, um, the flashing should be 24 inches wide. Hmm. Hip and Ridge 4.24 uh, Left hand column second paragraph The flashing generally is formed in 10 foot lengths and is lapped a minimum of 4 inches and right hand column at the top this cap generally fabricated in 10 foot uh, lengths should extend onto the shingle roof a minimum of four inches. Ridge flashing in a Mansford, Mansard roof. And it talks about the minimum gauge right there. So make sure you can find the minimum gauges for a Mansard. 4.28, roof penetration flashing. Recommend a minimum gauge for that flashing. I'm not going to read them all again, but make sure you can find it. Structural steel, roof penetration on a structural steel roof. There you go. What I have highlighted on page 4.32 is the recommended gauges. Let's go to equipment support flashing on page 4.34. Now you're going to have to flash in the legs of the equipment. When we're doing this uh, equipment stand, it says extend the flange onto the roof four inches. You fasten it over the roofing fellas. The flange is stripped in by the roofer. The size should extend up the roof for a minimum of four inches. Up from the roof, minimum of four inches. All joints should be seamed and sealed. A pitch pan should be two inches greater in length and width than to support it as flashing. It talks about the gauges that you're going to use for that flashing. Okay. And then there is the, the width of the equipment and how high the legs have to be. This is several times you're going to see this table if you haven't already. This is the one for SMACNA. They're all generally the same. Chimney flashing, 4.36. We're talking about counter flashing here. Left hand column, last, last paragraph. The length of each piece of counter flashing will vary with the slope of the roof, but no step should be more than three bricks high. Right hand column, four or five lines down. The base flashing is extended up the wall a minimum of four inches. The counter flashing is installed in a flashing receiver. The figure 418B, that's here, shows a saddle flashing cricket in place on the back of the chimney. Saddle flashings help divert rain and snow away from the chimney. Saddle flashing, second to last paragraph, must be flanged four inches up the wall of the chimney, four inches onto the roof. It's cleated to the roof deck on 12 inch centers using cleats the same material as a saddle. Step counter flashing is installed in a reglet as shown or may be installed in a flashing receiver. Building expansion joints on page 5.2 and 5.3. You know, check out that expansion joint there. All right. 
We're told in this left hand column, three paragraphs down, that that expansion joint cap is formed. Like you see there on the drawing, your cap pieces are formed in sections not to exceed 12 feet. And then that paragraph, at the last paragraph, tells you the, the gauge, the sizes of metal you can use for a building expansion joint. Let's go to page 6.14. 6.14, we're talking about standing seam roofs here. We're talking about standing seam roofs. Talk about metal roofs and what have you. Let's see. Um, it says on the top left of page 6.14 that the standing seam roof on those figures over there, 6.5 and 6.6, six, six, it's one on the next page, and seven is recommended for roofs having a slope of one inch per foot or greater. Slopes of three inch per foot or less are deemed low pitch. Medium pitch are those pitches are those over three, and it says up to six. Now let's go to uh, the top right. Pans are installed with cleats. All right, gives you a detail down here of a cleat. All right, double nailed on twelve inch centers. Next paragraph. Although short pans are, for, are, are shown in figure 6-5, roll form pan lengths of 30 feet or more might be used. Seams on such pans would be machine closed. I think we saw 40 foot in another book. That was a question that rocked my world the first time I took that test. How long can the pans be? Well, I saw another book that said 40 feet. But I don't think that question told you what book to go to either. All right, bottom of the page, width of the pan. If your pan is if your pan is 16 and 3 quarters of an inch wide and it has a 1 inch seam height and you're using aluminum, then it should be 32 thousandths. The wider the pan, as you can see, the thicker the metal, and that makes sense. There you go. Standing seam roof sizes, according to the smack the button. Batten seam roofs. When you're doing a batten seam roof with metal roofing, third paragraph, your spacing of your battens may vary to suit architectural styles, but the recommended maximum distance is 20 inches. There's a Bermuda roof here on page 6-22. It's not recommended for, slope, for roofs having a slope of less than 2.5 inches per foot. Your Bermuda roof, th fourth paragraph down, is applied beginning at the eave. The first pan is hooked over a continuous cleat, as shown in detail too. Next uh, right-hand column, first full paragraph, expansion joints should be used at least at at least every 25 feet and formed as shown in detail for expansion joints every 25 feet. Or detail 4 by the way if you're interested in that. Yeah, I didn't think so. Louvers on page 7.2, left hand column, second paragraph, where blades exceed 36 inches, that's these blades right here, the width, a 1 8 by 1 8 stiffener bar should be used. Other metal structures, chapter 8. When you have a gravity ventilator, like this one right here, Gooseneck, I think they call that. C should be 135 degrees minimum. That means you got to bring that baby around to at least 135 degrees from horizontal so you don't get rain blowing up in there. A 
Let's go to page 812. Smoke hatches. Right hand column, second paragraph. Serve as counter flashing. Bases serve as counter flashing and must therefore be two inches larger than the dimension than the curbs to allow clearance for composition based flashing, where the base of the smoke hatch does not provide at least four inch counter flashing. A separate counter flashing should be installed by the sheet metal contractor. Corner guards. You see what a corner guard is there? Are fabricated of stainless steel, minimum 18 gauge. We're getting close to the end of this book. Yay! Accessories, corner, excuse me, cornice, cornice restoration, assessment. In assessing the condition of existing cornice, first determine the material is made from. Typical cornices are made from 24 gauge galvanized steel, plain finished, crimped, or 16 ounce to 20 ounce copper. We're doing a restoration here, by the way. Okay. Left hand column under cornices. Sheet metal contractors are able to form metal cornices to virtually any shape. Two of these mini shapes are illustrated in 9 1. This is kind of weird. These, this can be an optical illusion. You got to look at that for a minute to understand what they're, what they're showing you there. That's like by a soffit. You got your soffit and then you have the angle down to the building. They call it a cornice. It's almost like into, on the interior you'd call it crown molding. On the exterior you'd call it a cornice. All right, there are, however, some mechanical limitations. Let's look at cornice joints, right hand column. During the original installation, the joints of these cornices were soldered on the back surface while they were lying flat before being hung in a, from a water table area. Okay. Form skylights, right hand column, second to last paragraph. Recommended materials for skylights are galvanized steel, copper, and stainless steel. We're in the appendices. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Page A1, Appendix A. You have, this is about uh, thickness and weight of sheet metals. This is galvanized and black iron. So if you're asked about black iron, this is the one you use. Here's your gauge. All right, here's how thick it is. This is the nominal, this is the max, this is the minimum. You have your weight in pounds per square foot. That's pretty much all you got to know. But that's galvanized and black iron. Let's look at A2. This is copper. Same thing. They give you 16 ounce copper. You know how thick it is. Now that's in millimeters. No, that's not in millimeters. That's in inches. I believe. 0.0216. Hmm. I just did some calculations. Yeah, this is actually in inches here. Millimeters is over here. If you take one, eight, uh, 1 divided by 8, you'll get real close to that. If you take 7 divided by 64, you'll get real close to that. So these are actually inches right here, and that's millimeters. Okay, and there's gauge over here. Thickness and weight of stainless steel, table A4, same deal, but it's stainless steel. Aluminum. Okay, you see in a, see in a pattern develop, zinc tin alloy, sheet lead. This is an interesting, this is probably one of the more interesting tables on page, it's table A8, expansion of building materials. Wow, what does all this mean? Well, each one of these gray blocks recommends, uh, excuse me, reflects or indicates um, as 64th of an inch. So if we're talking about copper here, copper has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So copper will expand in a 10 foot length, it'll expand 864th of an inch when there's a temperature change of 100 degrees. So 864th of an inch of, is, of course, an eighth of an inch. But each one of those blocks represents a 64th of an inch. Really bizarre way to demonstrate that concept, if you ask me. Appendix B, have aluminum, or as the English say, aluminum. All right, 
precautions. It cannot be soldered. Use rivets and, seal and uh, sealer. Weld the joints. Your tensile strength. There it is. 22,000 PSI. Uh, what do we have here? We have turn coated stainless material highly resistant to corrosion in several industrial chemical marine environments. Here's all the advantages. Lightweight, doesn't stain, durable, not affected by mortar or concrete. Tensile strength is 80,000 PSI. Mm. Kicks, kicks aluminum's ass, doesn't it? Appendix C. Nothing. Let's go to the next thing here, which is Appendix F. Moisture transfer methods, air movement. This is F1A. High vapor pressure moves moisture towards areas of low vapor pressure because of vapor pressure differential. Warm moist air tends to be driven through cracks and holes in the building where it will condense if the dew point temperatures are reached. The extent to which the building is under positive or negative pressure will predispose the direction of air movement through the building envelope. Air leakage, page F2, left hand column, halfway down. Seams, roof edges, and flashings are all considered sources for air leakage. That can provide avenues for the passage of moisture through the building envelope. No kidding. The last thing we're going to look at is the index, and the index is fairly weak. So don't count on it on test day. Make sure you just understand once again, just like the Narca manuals, how the book is organized.